Hey, welcome to Life in the Leadership Lane. I'm your host, Bruce Waller, where I get to talk to leaders that are making a difference in the workplace and in our community. What did they do to get started and what are they doing to stay there? And we are in season three. We are talking to Mike Coffee today. I'm so excited and, and you're going to really enjoy getting to know Mike Coffee. Mike is the president of Imperative Information Group. He's also certified in HR with his SPHR and his SHRM SCP. He's a board member for Texas SHRM and host of Good Morning HR. And glad to have you on the show, Mike. How you doing, buddy? Hey, I'm great. Thanks for having me, Bruce. I appreciate it. Absolutely. You know, we go way back. I was actually reflecting, and I've mentioned this before, but I think it was about 15 years ago. Uh, our company, yeah. yeah, our company was involved in a uh, retreat uh, with the great Brad Smith, and we went down to Glen Rose, Texas. Do you remember that? Oh, yeah. We, we did it, what, two or three times, I think. Yeah. Yeah, that was so fun. I mean, we were, uh, Brad had put together these, uh, an executive group. And, and we were down there uh, just, I mean, really building relationships. It was so much fun. It was. Yeah. yeah he so, and Jesse Owen were down there. And yeah, it was a good group. Yeah. No, it was fantastic. And then, of course, uh, you serve on Texas Sherman. We're going to talk more about that. But we just got through with our uh, winter meetings. What would you think about that in Austin, Texas? I thought it was great. It's it's great to be back in person. I, th I just feel like we're a lot more effective as a group of, of leaders from all over the state when we're working together in person. Uh, and Texas Sherm is all about those, those 32 chapters across the state having relationship and, and, you know, Texas Sherm is just the vehicle through which those, they cooperate. And, uh, so being in person, having those leaders from all over the state was, uh, it, it made it, it made it worth the trip to Austin. I've always thought you were, uh, uh and are a, a brilliant, brilliant business person. And, and I'm so excited to have you on the show, but I, I want to start, uh, first of all, talking a little bit about your company, Imperative. Share with the listeners, uh, who is Imperative Information Group and, and how do you serve your customers? Imperative is a background investigations company. We, we help risk-averse employers and businesses make well-informed hiring decisions and decisions about the people they involve in their companies. So a lot of it is employment-related background checks, but also due diligence on potential vendors, venture partners, anything where somebody needs to know about the people or the or other organizations that they're partnering with, they turn to us for that. And so we've got two brands. we got Imperative, which is kind of our corporate, you know, business focused. And then we've got PFC Household and Caregiver Screening. And that's focused on, on households that are hiring nannies, uh, domestic staff. Uh, we deal with a lot of family offices. Um, most of the mo most prominent nanny agencies and domestic staffing agencies in the country. So we've kind of, that's kind of the softer side of Sears. That's our softer marketing and more family oriented type stuff. Well, you've been doing it for a long time and, and uh, we're going to get into uh, background checks and uh, you know, when it comes to onboarding and, and, and the hiring process and things like that. But I want to start with the Mike Coffee story. I, I think you've grown up around this area and I know a little bit about you, but share like, where did you grow up and, and how in the world did you get into leadership and HR? And then of course you're an entrepreneur with your own organization. Well, I'm a Fort Worth boy. I'm bred in. I couldn't, I, there are other places I love to visit, but I couldn't live anywhere else but Fort mm. Worth. And uh, I'm, I've got deep roots here. Uh, my family's been here for over a century and uh, I'm, uh, I can't see myself doing anything else, but I uh, grew up on the west side of Fort Worth, and uh, we'll get into it, I'm sure, but I got my, I started my first job in fifth grade and haven't been unemployed since, and so uh, got deep roots here in the community, but uh, uh, got into HR after my first uh, business uh, went down in flames in my early 20s. I learned a lot, I, and I wouldn't do it again for a million dollars, but uh, it, was, uh, it, was, it, was, it, was, it was a good experience, but uh, in hindsight, to have in hindsight. I had done, I had done uh, in my previous uh, role uh, in aerospace, I had done training and OD work. Uh, and the day I closed my first business, I knew I had to pay the bills. So I went and uh, went down to Kelly Services. And back then we called them Kelly Girls. And I signed up as a Kelly Girl. And they sent me to uh, uh, immediately the next day to help uh a hospital get ready for the joint commission, uh, which is the uh, accreditation process for, for healthcare entities. 
and uh, I helped them with their HR uh, accreditation process. That turned into a, an actual regular gig there pretty quick. And next thing you know, I was uh, running a corporate HR group. Uh, and here we are. I started getting, got into some HR consulting. And then 23 years ago, had a, a consulting client uh, that I was helping improve their a nationwide financial services company. I was, I was working with them about their uh, employee selection process and how they, what they were doing there. They had some pretty deep problems that were uh, pretty apparent to their leadership and got involved there. And one thing led to the other. And they said, well, why don't you just do our background checks for us too? And so I, 23 years, I, I went home that night and told my wife, uh, hey, uh, these guys want me to do their background checks and it's a nationwide company. And, and she was pregnant with our first son. And she looked at me and said, buddy, all I got to tell you is you better figure something out because I'm not going back to work. And so uh, little did she know she was going to end up being an integral to the company. I don't think that was part of her plan. But so I always know how old the company is because my oldest son uh, is uh, just six months uh, younger than the company is. So that is fantastic. Oh, man. I got, man, there's so much. First of all, what was that job you had in fifth grade? I mean, oh, child labor laws here. What's yeah. happening here? I was a rancher. <laughs> a rancher? I worked at a, uh, yeah, every day after school, I worked at a chinchilla ranch. Chinchilla uh, ranch? <laughs> yeah, I fed and watered chinchillas every day after school. I and mean, the chinchillas are like these big furry rats. It's the densest, it's the densest fur in the world. And, and among the most expensive uh, furs. And it happened to be that um, about a mile from my house, I lived on in the far west side of Fort Worth, which is really rural back then. Okay. It's grown up since. But uh, old Mr. Watson, he had, he was one of the world's leading chinchilla ranchers. I mean, he was, he won like the national states and international awards and all this it was well known. And I knew he hired high school kids. And so uh, I was in fifth grade. This is the summer before my fifth grade year. And I, uh, I asked my mom for money so I could ride my bike about two miles to the, the nearest little store. That's what we called it. We were country. <laughs> it was the little store. I, it probably had a name, but it was the little store to us. <laughs> I'm going to get me a Coke at the little store. Um, but so I, uh, she said, get a job. That's just what she said. Just kind of offhand, just to, you know, blow me off. Okay, so I went and knocked on Mr. Watson's door and said, "Are you hiring?" And he looked down at me, and <laughs> you know, I wasn't—I was about half the size of any of the high school kids he had. But he—he he gave me a shot, and I worked there fifth grade all the way through the end of my freshman year of high school. Wow! Yeah, and wow. Uh, it was uh, about three, you know I, he was paying me well below minimum wage, but it was—it <laughs> was pocket money, and it was pretty good for fifth for middle school kid. I was doing okay. That's pretty good. I was just posting something the other day about when I was working at uh, my parents' bowling center in 1981. So I would have been 15. So that's way before 15. Fifth grade. That's fantastic. Now, you said something earlier, too, during that process that really when someone says uh, I failed, my, uh, it went up in flames. I admit it, let, let my ears perk up. And I always want to know, like, what was that like? Failure. I mean, we all go through it, right? And you said, um, I am I learned from it, but I wouldn't want to go back and do it. Talk, talk about, like, what was that all about? Yeah, the uh, it was, uh, I didn't know what I didn't know, right? Mm -hmm. And I came mm -hmm. out of it a lot smarter than I, than I went into it. So uh, it was... Uh, it was two grueling years of uh, trying to, you know, make a kind of a cockamamie scheme work and uh, not really knowing what I, you know, what questions I should have asked on the front end. Uh, but all in all, it really prepared me for this role. Yeah. And, and, you know, um, just the reality is, had I not closed my business on that day, the mm -hmm. day I did, and walked into Kelly Services the next day, I wouldn't have ended up uh, at what's now Texas Health Resources. And I would have not met my wife there. And my and I wouldn't have my boys and my wife. So I look at my life and I've got no complaints. Uh, that was a hard time, but um, you know, diamonds are formed under pressure. And I feel like, uh, you know, I, I, we just, I, I, I 
took the hand that was dealt me and did the best I could with it. I want to, I want to stay here just for a second, because I mean, you're sitting here um, grateful for, for, oh, fa- totally. for failure. And uh, you know, a lot of times. And I don't even know if it's failure. I don't even like the term no. failure. It didn't work out the way I wanted it to, Ah, but yes. you know, I, I learned something from it and it put me, you know, it's just that little trajectory change that it took me on, got me to right where I would much rather be where I am right now than still running a dry cleaning business. That's for sure. And I wouldn't have my wife and my kids and in my life and, and we wouldn't be friends probably. So, I mean, I, I came out well ahead uh, when it was all said and done. I'm glad you shared that because there's listeners right now that may be going through something like that. And, and I just want them to hear from someone that has had success. That that's part of that process. And a lot of times we don't think about the importance and I said gr- gratitude, but the importance of keeping perspective. Right. We, we hear a lot of stories around perspective. I was just listening to Tom Brady, uh, Tom Brady. Of course, we all know who Tom Brady is, but he was telling this story about the Chinese farmer. And, and, uh, and if you haven't read that, uh, go, go, type, you know, type that in. But it's all about perspective. And it's all about we don't know if things are, I mean, really that bad. We won't really know until later in life, right? But 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 they shape us for our next, right? So right. when something's happening that may be bad, it may not be bad, right? Another door opens, right? Yeah, and the worst it can do is kill you. I mean, if, if death is the worst thing we have to fear, and you know what mm. it's Marcus Aurelius says, if there's gods and there's an afterlife, then you've got that. Mm. And if death is just you know a cease of existence. Then what's the problem? You know, then what do you what do you have to fear from that? And wow. I'm a I'm a you know I think that I, I I grew up not knowing what I couldn't do, yeah. and just trying stuff and and adjusting and uh, you know we've pivoted the company over the years different directions and done different things and made some you know big screw ups and and learned from them and moved on, but um, you can't. You know, it's a, it's. I think perspective is a is a good way to say it, or just uh, just acceptance that mm-hmm. there are precious few things in our world that were really under our control. So few, they can they can be a giant lever to change you know the course of our lives and other people's lives, but we have so little control. So why do we spend so much time worrying about outcomes that that we you know we're we're putting the seasoning on the meat? That's all we can mm-hmm. do. You know that you know, how it turns out is well beyond our control. And we, people spend so much time worrying about things that they really don't have control over. So why give it the energy and and all the worry? Let let me ask you, and I always like to ask my guests this because I think, you know, you're, you're in a great spot today, right? You're leading a company. You've been doing it for a long time. You love what you do. You're involved in a lot of different things. Uh, But I always like to talk about people that have helped us get away. We wouldn't call them mentors or sponsors, but have you ever had like some mentors that have helped you to get to where you are? And like, if you have, like, what was it about them that made him such a great mentor? Yeah, I've had a lot of them. I always, I'm convinced that success, however you want to define it, is, is, is made up of three things, luck, mindset, and skill in that mm-hmm. order. Mm-hmm. And I have been so lucky my entire life to have amazing people uh, guide me sometimes stump me on the forehead and tell me, hey, that's not how you want to do this. Uh, my grandfather, who really in many ways raised me and was my father figure, I watched him get up and go to work every day. He got up, he, he left the house at 5 a.m. to go to work every day. Uh, and, you know, I knew work wasn't something to be uh, feared and it was, it was a noble. Uh, and then Mr. Watson, the, the old chinchilla rancher, uh, he would say he, he had all this, this kind of homespun uh, wisdom. And, but the one thing that I can, he said all the time, and it just rings in my ears, even, you know, 40 plus years later, um, Tiger, he called me Tiger. The Tiger, you work for a man for a day's pay, you give a man a day's work. And he said that all the time, probably when he caught me screwing around, but it stuck with me and, and it, it struck me then and now is that's noble. I mean, you know, that's all the work relationship really is. It's a contract. It's an agreement. I'm going to, I'm going to do this work for you and you're going to pay me for it. And we're going to both act honorably. So that was great. And then when I got into the, the proper side of the HR world, uh, I had a 
VP of HR that I reported to, who uh, took me under her wing, and her name is Diane Gallo. She's uh, she's down in, in the Houston area now, and uh, brilliant, brilliant HR leader. And she had the unique ability that I've always tried to emulate of seeing the untapped potential in other people. And, um, and she did that with me and, and cultivated me. And, and still, you know, I was in my, you know, mid to late twenties, thought I knew everything. And uh, there were times where she had to reel me in and, and set me straight. And there were times where other people said, you know, she was nuts for letting me run projects that I got to run. And, uh, and that faith that she gave showed me, made me double down and make sure I, I, I you know, I did right by her. Um, you know, our, our, our mutual friend, Brad Smith. Oh, yeah. Nobody, Brad. nobody can tell you more about building relationships that are fruitful mm. for everybody involved than, than Brad. And, and there's been plenty of times over the year that, in fact, I talked to him this morning. Uh, there have been plenty of times over the years where Brad's given me uh, some great advice. So it, it's, a, it's a never ending list. Uh, I've, uh, well, and, you know, I also got lucky. I, you know, again, luck is the first, first key, I think. And I married my best friend mm -hmm. and, uh, and, you know, I've, she's always had my back and I've always known, Hey, if, if this all blows up tomorrow, it doesn't really matter because mm -hmm. she, she's got my back and we'll be okay. And, uh, so, you know, I, it, it takes a village to raise the village idiot. And, uh, and you know, I've done okay so far. What a blessing uh, to be surrounded by great people. I, I love this. Listen, uh, if you're listening right now, you need to be writing this down. Luck, mindset, and skill. Love that. That's going to be my book. One of these days when I get around to it, I'm going to write that book. I love uh, it. I'm, I'm convinced of, I'm convinced that's been my approach to life for a long time. I love it. And now I know that, you know, when I see you now, I can say, Hey, Tiger. Yeah. <laughs> That's fantastic. Uh, if you're going, if a man's going to pay you for the day, you need to give him a day's work. Yeah. Give him a day's work. I, I, I love that. And, and of course, Diana, uh, seeing untapped potential. I love the way you said that untapped potential. I mean, seeing the good in people. And I just, oh, and even when they it. don't, and I think it's important, even when they don't see it. Hmm. You know, that's the, you know, we, you know, I was a cocky kid who thought I knew everything, uh -huh. but then, but she was able to pull stuff out of me that I thought was, wasn't who I was, hmm. you know, I, I'm not going to, you know, I, I would have never have dreamed to hmm. take on this kind of project or do that. Uh, and, and, and she could do that. And I, I've tried to do that with, with my team and my employees, uh, even my own sons over the years. Uh, it's, uh, I think that's, uh, that's a real skill is, and sometimes it burns you, right? Mm -hmm. Sometimes you, sometimes you invest in somebody, you think they're going to do this and, and they let you down, but really they're not letting me down. They're letting themselves down. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and, or sometimes it's just, I was wrong. This mm -hmm. wasn't a good fit for them. And that's, mm -hmm. and I have to own that too. But, uh, but I think I'd say more often than not, I've, I've got the thrill of watching somebody succeed where they didn't think they would have, or wouldn't even gone down to that road. One of my best analysts, one of my best background check analysts, and our clients love her. Uh, she came to, to us with no college. Uh, she had delivered pizzas mm -hmm. for Papa John's okay. for the four previous years out of high school. And she came in at an entry level admin clerical role and has been with us for quite a while. And is, is my, you know, my best analyst. She's the mm -hmm. one that clients want to talk to. She, and, and it's, uh, it's just, you know, it's great. Uh, and she, her life is different because, you know, there was something in, in that process of hiring her that we said, Hey, this is somebody we can invest in. And it's been, you know, it's been great for her and it's, it's been super for us. I mean, it's, it's not pure benevolence on my part. It's, you know, we benefit from, from having her on our team. Well, I want to, uh, speaking of the team, I want, I want to dive into this. I, I want to learn a little bit more and I want our listeners to learn a little bit more about uh, what you do for companies. And, and, you know, so when you say she's your best analyst, yeah. like what, what makes her the best or someone that you would say, Hey, they, they are my best, whatever position they are. Like right. what, what is it about them? You know, in, we have it. We have hiring those roles. People who okay. are putting assembling the data, okay, uh, around background checks. 
uh, this is an industry that's heavily commoditized. It's about okay. fast and cheap, largely, and databases and all of that. And there are a lot of errors and, and data issues with that stuff, that kind of, of, of report. So we're focused on a tiny part of the, the market that really wants to make the investment to do it right. Oh, it's okay. like you. It's like it's not diff that different than Armstrong, right? right? I mean, you can go down the road and hire, you know, two guys in a truck, yeah. and uh, and have your move done, or you can have it done by people that you really trust, and you know it's going to get there, and and you're going to you're you know have a much higher level of success. That's what we do, but uh, you know, I know that having having people who can sit and focus. Mm -hmm. And, mm -hmm. and think about things from the client's point of view. Our goal is that our clients never have to pick up the phone and say, I don't understand what this means. Mm -hmm. They call me and say, hey, uh, you know, what is this? This isn't clear on the report. That's going to be a topic at our next team meeting about, OK, so how do we say this differently or how we approach this differently when, it, when, it, when it comes up next time? And but have, finding people who care. Mm. Get, who get why why what we do how mm -hmm. making helping employers make well informed hiring decisions well, well let me ask you about that and by the way i love how you said look at it from the customer's point of view i think that is so key uh for building that incredible that relationship and doing things different uh let me ask you this when companies are typically looking for like background check. That's typically what companies are looking for when they're, when they're talking to you for the most part, your general, sure. your core. Um, well, is that something that like, what are a lot of them doing now? Do they do that in house? Do they just go over the internet or what, what do you see yeah. out there? Well, most of them are doing something over the internet um, okay. or they're using one of the big screening. There's, you know, there's been so much, uh, uh, so many acquisitions and consolidation in our industry. Okay. There, there are a handful of giants out there and they're, they've got all, you know, really almost all the big giant corporate contracts because it's going through procurement and it's going to the low bidder. Mm -hmm. And so there's a, there, you know, we've, we've identified a, a half dozen ways that the big guys cut corners that put employers at risk. And we just make sure we don't do those, right? Mm -hmm. And so our clients, you know, we never want to have to, our goal is to never have to tell a client, hey, we're sorry. And as soon as we screw up, and we do on occasion, we always say it, and I will pick up the phone and, and be the one that says it. But uh, our goal is never to have to do that. And, and you know, 90% isn't good enough for, for, for our clients. And so we, we spend a lot of time getting it right. But but a lot of a lot of employers out there, they just want a piece of paper in the file to say, yeah, we did our background yeah. check. And that's what and they're not a good fit for us. And, uh, you know, we'll certainly sell them a great background check if they'll pay the, the fee for it. But most of them want to spend 30, 30, 40, 50 dollars. And you're just not going to do the kind of due diligence you really need to do for that. And most of them, most of our clients came to us after something went wrong. Mm. You know, I, uh, you know, I, uh, you know, their, their employment law attorneys, you know, almost all our business comes from referrals from current clients or employment law attorneys or HR consultants. Okay. Uh, and, and most of our clients came to us after something went wrong and somebody said, why did we hire this person in the first place? And, uh, and then they get referred to us and, and we try to help them, you know, prevent that mistake again. But, uh, you know, there's, there's all kinds of, you know, there's databases out there. People just go, like the Texas Department of Public Safety has a criminal records database for the state of Texas. And a lot of okay. employers and school districts rely on it. But you get in there and it's missing a third of the people on death row. That's how bad DPS's data is. And so people, if it didn't have the death row guy, it didn't have the, it didn't have the sexual assault guy or the other folks in there that aren't on death row. And now the good news is the death row folks aren't looking for work. But all the other folks we know from from, you know, we run hundreds of those uh, those reports every week from DPS. And we're searching all the counties where people have lived, worked, attended school. You know, usually somebody physically walking into that courthouse to check those criminal records. And we know a third of the records we find in the county don't show up in DPS's data. So there's a lot of ways to cut corners and and uh, we just don't do it. Let, let me ask you this. What's a what's a like a little red flag? I always think about the uh, the restaurant. It was a Poncho's that had that little red oh, flag yeah. that would roll Raise up. The flag. Um, what's that little red flag? If somebody's right now listening to the show and, and and they're you know they're serving in an HR role and, and maybe they're maybe they're in charge of this particular piece of the uh, of the hiring process. 
Um, what's something that would like flag saying, hey, you know what, we probably need to reach out to someone and not necessarily, you know, just go over the internet. Are there any things that like, uh, that trigger that, that you, like you see out there, like, you know what, we get a lot of calls because of this. Yeah. Two th- two, the two big ones are, first of all, I hear from prospective employers, we're kind of concerned because our background checks keep, come, keep coming back clear you know, no records found on these guys, but the guys admitted to us up front that they had this history. And uh, and then we call the background screening company and they give us some excuse why this record that the guy admitted to didn't show up on the background check. Mm. And that's a that's a red flag. And the other one's the other direction. Um, the, the background check company reports a record on somebody that really doesn't belong to them. Mm. And that happens too often. And that's just because they're relying on databases and sloppy information. Uh, and those are the two most obvious red flags. But um, the depth of the research is a, is a big deal. Um, some states severely limit what employers can consider as far okay. as criminal history. Like in California, you can only an employer can only consider a conviction in the last seven years, period. And so deferred adjudication, they pled guilty and served probation. An employer in California can't consider that. And a lot of screening companies limit nationwide what they will tell employers to California's rules. And we're the exact opposite of that extreme. And and the people in our industry often think we're nuts because we're putting all this extra labor in. But we report everything we can legally report to the employer and that they can legally use. So in Texas, pew, pew, you can pretty much consider everything. um, And so everything we can legally report in Texas is a lot more uh, than we do in, than we can to our clients in California. So, uh, but but it's a ton of work, right, to figure out what's going on. And even at the city by city, San Francisco has its own rules. New York City has its own rules. Madison, frickin' Wisconsin has its own rules. Hmm. And so we're having to ma- manage. You know, okay, this employee lives in New York City, and they live in the job that they're applying for is in Madison, Wisconsin. So what's the most con- you know restrictive of the rules there? We're doing all of that kind of stuff to make sure we get as much as we can to our clients without giving them the rope to hang themselves with. Yeah. So, Look, yeah, no, that, that's, that's fascinating. I, I, I think uh, people listening, uh, have learned a lot from this. Hey, one thing that I have always admired about you, Mike, uh, I've always thought you're a brilliant business person, but also uh, you get out and you speak a lot. And th- that's one thing I admire about you is you get out there and, and you do your share of it too, buddy. <laughs> well, we both do, but you're, you're talking, you're, you're help educating. T- talk a little bit, uh, just share, what are a couple of topics that you like to speak about that you, you, you've gotten great feedback on? And I know there's probably a lot of people listening right now that have heard you speak <laughs> very funny, uh, but very informative and very educational. Uh, just share maybe a couple of topics and, and why you enjoy talking about them. The other adjective that you didn't say was inappropriate. And I think I get that a lot too, but, um, you know, second chance hiring, I've got, I've got several presentations around that. And I think okay. that's really important. And I love, I love to present to HR groups around that because I find most HR, most employers, most business owners want to do the right thing by folks and want to, and, and they recognize we can't have a society full of people who are unemployable and most of them want to do that but they don't know what the tool, they don't have the tools. And so mm-hmm. I freely, we developed the tools over the last 23 years. I give them away. They're on our website and Good. we've got web recorded webinars. Second chance hiring is a big one. And the other side is, you know, like you said, I'm, I own this business and I, I love the idea of strategy values, uh, accountability. And in fact, uh, I've, I'm, I'm presenting this Friday down in San Antonio, the, uh, around uh, uh, using your val- your organizational values as an accountability and planning tool. And um, so those kind of things, I've got presentations around strategy, values, accountability. I think that stuff's, um, that's, those are the areas that HR can make a real difference in an organization. I enjoy those things. And so that's a big topic. I love how you shared, like, yes, we talk about, I talk about, I want to help people in the area of background, but I want to just help people. And when you start talking about speaking about values, I think you just set yourself apart from a lot of people, because you're saying, you know what, I'm, I just want to help people, right? right? And, you know, of course, in your organization, uh, values are pretty important, right? Right, yeah. Any, any, anybody on my team, if you call my office, they better be able to rattle off all three of our values. <laughs> and so it's always act with integrity, always act in the best interest of the customer, and always act as one 
with compassion and respect. And uh, those are, yeah, and we talk about those all the time. And th- that's, those are real key to, uh, to who we are. And that's how that. we hire. We hire more about, you know, we, because all employers always make the mistake, often make the mistake at least, yeah. of hiring for skills. Okay. But then we have to manage and fire people for behavior. Mm-hmm. And I think it's a lot easier to get people skills. That's why in my thing, you know, luck, uh, mindset, and uh, uh, skill, skill's the third one, mm-hmm. because okay. I can give you the skills. If you've got the basic aptitude and competencies, I can give you the skills. What I can't do is change your behavior. And so values are all about finding the, va- the behavior that we value as an organization and that we're going to incentivize and reward. And uh, I think a lot of employers still haven't quite got there as far as really using their values as, as hiring criteria. I love how you shared that. And we can't ever underestimate the power of talking about values. And, and I want to touch on this because a, a funny story, uh, as, I, as I think back, and I shared this in my very first book, Find Your Lane. And I talk about when I'm a young, I was a young manager and we were in this training class and the trainer was talking about values, right? And so we got, you know, this, everybody got a sheet of paper. It was like 50 values on the paper and you're supposed to like circle your top 20 and then get it down to 10 and get to your top five. Right. And then he said, okay, everybody. And, and of course, everybody in the company was there. The CEO, all the, all the C-suite were there on the front row. I mean, everybody was there. And he said, okay, everybody that had integrity as your number one, raise your hand. And at the time... <laughs> Honestly, I didn't know what integrity even meant. I mean, I was like, <laughs> that's not my number one. I don't even know what it is. All leaders on the front row raised their hand. And I thought to myself, that is isn't pretty important. I better go find out more about that. And today, you know, that's one of my core values, right? And so when you talk about that, you can't assume that people know what values are and the importance of leading with values, Right. right. That's right. And, and your organization has values, right? Mm. Whether they're written down or not, mm. you've got values. There's, there's behavior that you're rewarding. It may be the wrong behavior. It may not be the right behavior that'll set the organization up for success in the long term. And it's just short term stuff. It's that salesperson that, that, you know, causes chaos and steps on people and, but they bring in the revenue, they close the deals, uh, but they're, they're killing everybody else around them. And, and, once they've handed off uh, the account to operations, somebody's got to go clean up their messes. Uh, but, but hey, you know, bottom line, they're bringing in the revenue. That's short-term thinking, and it's not the behavior mm. that that's going to, you know, turkeys don't or eagles don't fly with turkeys, and yeah. it's not the kind of behavior that's going to bring the kind of people you want in your organization, to, or at least get them to stick around. And so, uh, yeah, we all have values, uh, and a lot of people have never stopped to think think through what theirs are. And, uh, you know, I keep mine on my, uh, I use Asana as my project manager and at the top of my task list are my, my personal values. Just to remind me, uh, that, uh, you know, you know, that this is who I want to be. And, mm. and there are days where my values are more aspirational mm-hmm. in reality. There are days where I, you know, I, I'm just not feeling it. And I, I've really got to work to, to be true to those. And there's other days where, man, I'm in the groove and, I'm living my best life. And, but I have to keep reminding myself of what they are. And I keep that in front of me, man. I got chills. <laughs> that is so good. Let me, let me ask you this. What, what, what drives you? I mean, you, you're a pretty busy guy. Uh, you speak, you, I mean, you're doing a lot of stuff. Like what drives you every day? I just love what I do. I mean, I, I've, I've been lucky enough that I've been able to build the life that lets me gives me the freedom to do what I want to do. And that really boils down to helping people Mm -hmm. uh, getting to, you know, there's some vanity here. One of my, one of my values is, uh, is earned admiration. I mean, and I put it right there. I, you know, I admit I value that. That's about, you know, that's something I personally value. I like people saying, Hey, thank you for that. Or, Mm -hmm. Hey, good job. Or, Hey, we really trust Mike coffee. That means a ton to me. Mm. And so I keep that right, you know, and um, so it's, 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 it's helping people and, you know, maybe 60% of the time you get a thank you, that 60% is gold to me. I'll take it every time. And, um, and then my, you know, my wife and kids, I, I uh, we, I'm down to one at home and I'm going to love him so much more <laughs> after he graduates in May 
he graduates high school in May and goes off to college. I'm gonna his love factor is gonna go up by 20 percent because he won't be under my roof anymore. <laughs> but uh, I love all my boys from a distance, and uh, but you know they they are what I've done, spent the last 23 years you know preparing for them to be on their uh, on their own and uh, out of my hair and living their best lives. Write it down, folks. Earned admiration. I just love that. I was actually thinking when you said you built a life that you love, uh, I'm right there with you. And I, I posted something on LinkedIn not too long ago, and I got a lot of feedback from it. And I said, you know, back back before I took a job at Armstrong, you know, at 37, I was managing my days and I learned to start leading my life. Mm, yeah. and, and and doing that in a way. And a lot of that is through values, what you talked about, right? Knowing values and not just knowing our values, but uh, looking at other people and, and seeing and, and finding out what their values are you know, and what's important to them and, and just trying to build that life of who you want to be, like take a little bit of from everyone and just make it your own, right? Let me right. ask you this. I always like to ask a question, like when you, you know, I mean, you start you started out in fifth grade. I mean, come on. Um, and you know, you've worked all the way up to where you are now. When was that moment you found your lane? You, you found that like that calling that you said, just like what you just said just now. I love what I do. You know, the thing, the pivot point, I think, was the day I decided I had to close that first business. Mm. Um, it was it was just um some, you know, when I, I said, okay, I'm going to look at the facts. I'm going to look at reality here and I'm going to make this decision and I'm going to set aside, I could have dragged it out another six months or a year yeah. and maybe with different results, but probably not. Mm -hmm. uh, and, but I had to just say, I'm going to set aside ego here. I'm going to do what, you know, I, you know, I owed money, I owed people money and I, and people that had, 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 you know, backed my venture and, and I was going to have to, you know, say, you know, I'm not going to ask for more money. Uh, you know, that's what would be necessary and we're not going to do it. And I just made that decision. And once I made it, it was so liberating because mm. I was like, okay, I am, you know, the few things that I have control over, I, I'm controlling and everything else is outside of my control. So I'm going to step out here and say, here's what we're going to do because of the circumstances. This is what I can do. And, and just, and from that day forward, I've, I've always had the confidence that whatever, whatever brings me, if it doesn't kill me, I'm fine. I love and that. so that's, that's really when it was. And so, you know, I don't have, I didn't have to be in the background check business. I could have stayed in HR and I would have been just as happy. Uh, I don't have any, any concerns about, about that. I would have, it would have been a different path, but uh, you know, as long as I ended up with my wife and kids, everything else is going to be fine. That's fantastic. Hey, I want to, I want to get in this real quick. You, you serve uh, also. I mean, <laughs> if you're not busy enough, you serve not just Texas Sherm, you serve a lot of different organizations, but I want to talk about Texas Sherm in particular. Uh, what, what do you like you've been, and you've been serving Texas Sherm for a long time. I mean, obviously yeah. from a Fort Worth chapter standpoint, as well as the state uh, today, you're the, uh, uh, you know, assistant state director, district director. Uh, talk a little bit about, uh, what you do for Texas Sherm and how has it helped you uh, as a business person or, or, or just how does it help you in general? Well, uh, right now, my role is, like I said, assistant state director over the district directors. And so okay. the district directors are HR leaders from the chapters across the state who are tasked to help coordinate and support the local chapters. So if a local chapter, if El Paso uh, has a question, we can co coordinate an answer from Austin or Waco, you know, uh, Heart of Texas or any of the other chapters, and they can share each other. And my heart's always been with those small to medium sized chapters yeah. who don't have paid staff and don't have uh, big bank, bank budgets and are just, you know, run often by a handful of volunteers who are just really dedicated. And I just, you know, working with those folks is, is, is just a joy for me. So helping them solve their problems. Um, you know, I've uh, helped a number of chapters do their strategic planning and stuff like that over the years and help them put plans and execute and then take back, maybe learn a lesson or two from me in that process and take it back to their companies. Um, that's uh, for me, that's, that's what I get out of it is, is those relationships. Plus 
it gives me an audience, you know, and I get to go talk and people sit there and listen and they don't <laughs> often throw vegetables. And so it's, it's good. I love that. I love it. And you do a great job. As a matter of fact, I saw a post where you went out and I think Kathy Hardcastle went out to um, uh, North, a, North a, Texas. We did North Texas. Texas. Yeah. yeah. North yeah. Texas. Sure. I mean, and part yeah. of that. And so I, you know, and that was on a Saturday, right? Yeah. And this is not a paid gig. I mean, you're, you know, you're going out there, you're trying to help them and support them. And so I just, I, I love what you do and I appreciate everything you do for Texas. Sherm. Hey, I want to ask you this. Uh, and, and as if you even <laughs> have a little bit more time, you started Good Morning HR podcast. Yeah. Talk about like what is that all about, and, and why, why did you why did you start the podcast, and, and uh, how's it going? Good morning, HR. I'm Mike Coffee, and this is the podcast where I talk to business leaders about bringing people together to create value for shareholders, customers, and the community. So that's basically what it's about. Uh, it's a it's a thirty minute podcast. Uh, we drop every week, and uh, I just talk to business business leaders, uh, trusted advisors about the business of bringing people together to create value. And um, so you know, we you know it's been great. We're I'm dropping episode thirty two this week. So we started last fall. It's been on my to do list for years. Uh, I wanted to do it. In fact, I was sitting in a conference in DC in I think 2011 or 20, probably at least 20, probably 2011, and uh, sitting to a conference session and kind of bored by the speaker and uh, just writing down marketing ideas. And I, I got the idea for Good Morning HR. I didn't know what I was going to do with it, but mm -hmm. goodmorninghr.com. And right there on my early, early Apple iPhone, I, I, I got on Dotster and I bought that domain. And then it sat there from 2011 till 2021 and I didn't use it. And then we were set and I wanted, and I'll be honest, I love doing the podcast, but it's, it's about relationships. All yeah. my business relationships. So yeah. this is, there's only so many people I'm going to meet at, at going to the Sherm conferences and speaking at all the Sherm meetings and stuff, which I love doing. And this is a way to meet more influencers and more people who, Maybe they trust me. Our whole marketing plan is the fewer people who think my coffee is an a-hole, the better <laughs> off we are. And so that's kind of how we, you know, and so me just being a nice guy. And so this is the way to, to do that. And so I always knew that, you know, this podcast would be a, a great way to do that and be interesting, hopefully, uh, and educational. And so I had an amazing marketing person come to work for me last January, uh, fresh out of school, super sharp. And and I mentioned that, you know, hey, you know, I've been, this is one of the things that's been on the back burner for a long time. I think we should, you know, I've thought about doing it. She jumped on that like a pit bull and wow. just executed because I'm great at the vision stuff, man. I love the big picture, but ask me to put tab A in slot A, it'll never happen. That's just not my strength. Okay. And uh, I just, and, and she executed on that and, and was amazing and put it all together. We got a great producer and, uh, and it's, it's been so much fun. So, uh, and it's one of the few podcasts that gives you HRCI and Sherm research credit. Okay. And so you get half a research credit and some of them are even uh, business, what we used to call strategic HRCI credit. And, uh, and so every week there's half, a, so you can get just from listening to me, uh, you know, ask dumb questions of smart people. You can get, you know, you can get 26 uh, credits a year just from that. It's like, it's like sitting in, in HR Southwest while you drive to work every day. <laughs> I love it. And I will put a link in the show notes for all the listeners that want to check out Good Morning HR. They can click on the link and, and, and subscribe to that. You know, I always like to say when you said that, it reminds me, I always uh, talk about ideas are easy. Execution is hard. Oh, yeah. Right. right. It is just yeah. hard. And I've, hey, I've, I've done well surrounding myself by people yeah. with people whose skills are different right. than mine. And so, yeah, and they, they're amazing. That's it. Yeah, no, that's that's the, one of the keys and one of the common threads I find for uh, my, all of my guests on life and leadership lane. I mean, uh, they're just surrounded by incredible people. Hey, let me ask you this before we pivot over to it's time to accelerate. I always like to ask if you've ever been given any advice. You shared the advice from, of course, Mr. Watson. I just love that. But any other advice? that you have been given, like you just find yourself sharing with your team or, or with people just in your path? I, I, I'm curious. I always like to ask that question. You know, the thing that, that comes back is, um, is what Brad Smith told, told me years ago. And we've and I've heard different versions of it. You've heard it before. 
uh, in, in different settings, but it, people will never remember what you said, mm. but they will remember how you made them feel. Mm. And, and for me, that translated to, to being sincere in my relationships with people. And, uh, and at times just saying, you know, saying the thing that I really want to say to this person isn't going to help them. And it's, it's not going to really make me feel better. So I'm just going to keep my mouth shut. And, uh, and, and, you know, there's no reason to make this person feel bad. And, uh, and there's, you know, and there are people it's, you know, even to me, people are unpleasant sometimes. And it's, you know, it's, it's, I don't understand why, but I, you know, I've learned that if, uh, if I can leave people just feeling a little better off about the situation, you know, and sometimes it's just means me not saying what I want to say. And other times it's, it's just being affirming to them and, and, uh, or helping them, you know, trying to help them set a right perspective, but whatever it is, but that, that, that thing from Brad, uh, it was the first time I'd ever heard it and it was probably easily 15 years ago. And it was, you know, but I, you know, what you say is, is a lot less important than than how people feel when it's done, and they, you know, so I always want people to know that I'm acting in good faith and that uh, and with and respect, even if it's a hard message I'm delivering. Isn't that amazing how you can create incredible impact uh, by maybe something you shared or just being part of a conversation? Uh, in my new book, uh, Life and Leadership Lane, my last chapter, I talk about five star experiences and each time I have a guest on the show, they share something that just, it's so impactful. And I just, I try to capture it because I know that will help me grow. And then I always get this great feeling of knowing that, wow, anybody who's listening to the show is going to feel the very same thing. So when you talk about how it made them feel, I, I just, I, I'm right there with you. And that, that that's uh man, what a blessing. That is so cool. You know, uh, I told you that the time is going to fly by. Uh, so we're going to shift over. It's time to accelerate. I'm going to ask you just a few questions. First question I always like to ask is, would you rather read a book or listen to a podcast? I know you probably do both. I'm a, li- I'm, I'm a big listener though, okay. even audio books. I, I've been a, I've been a audible uh, subscriber since 1999. What? Uh, back before they had smartphones and you had to buy an actual audible book player uh, and it took like hours to download a book. Uh, and so I've, uh, and I'm on a plan that I get two books a month for a ridiculously small amount of money. And I listen to usually three or four a month. And then, uh, and then I've got a, a list of podcasts that I, I listen to. Uh, and so, yeah, I'm, I'm, I have a, like, I'm my favorite economist is a guy named mm-hmm. Tyler Cowan. Okay. And I just, I just got the, uh, the, the proof of his, his book, uh, cause he's going to be on the podcast when it's released in May. And, and I'm actually have to read the paper version of the book and it's going to kill me because I can, I, I'm not a sit down and I'm not a sit still person. I have a hard time sitting still and watching TV. And so, um, I, I, I listen to audio books and podcasts all day long when I'm washing di- I, I volunteer to wash the dishes here at the house so that's my listen. job and fold laundry because i'll fold laundry and do dishes because nobody wants to talk to you when you, they stay away from you when you're folding laundry and doing dishes because they don't want to help and so i get to listen to the audio and so yeah I'm, I'm a big audio person i love that man that was so good that was so good man you are a very very energizing person i want to ask you outside of all the stuff we've talked about you know s- serving in the community uh running your company what energizes you outside of the workplace? You know, I get up every morning at five. Okay. And, and usually even on the weekends. Okay. Uh, and I hit, uh, my wife and I work out at 6 a.m. Monday through Friday. Uh, practice, I, I, I practice yoga four or five times a week. Uh, and I uh, do a high intensity interval training workout at least three times a week, sometimes four. Um, I love that. That's, uh, you know, for me, that community, that's my second, that's my second or third or fourth community is, is are all the folks that, that, that I work out with. I've got a close cohort of really close friends and we have breakfast a couple of days a week mm. and I wouldn't trade that one hour that we have breakfast together for anything in the world. It's, uh, it's, it, it's, I, I block those off. Nobody is scheduling breakfast over those times. Uh, uh, spending a lot of time with my my wife and kids, and I'm really anxious to be an empty nester 
more so than my <laughs> wife. I love my kids, but but it's going to be wheels up for Christy and I. You know, nine and a half years ago, we put a 10 year plan in place that we could do whatever we had to do for the company from anywhere in the world because we love to travel. And we're going to be able to, uh, you know, go plant roots. Um, you know, my middle son lives in Oslo, Norway and dances with the Norwegian National Ballet. And so we're, we plan on spending a lot of time in, in Europe with him. Uh, we we love San Miguel de Allende. We like to just plant and then experience the local community, not just hit the tourist sites. And so, you know, so we got that coming. It's um, I'm, I'm jazzed about all of that. And I have a, you know, I've got my family, my extended, you know, my 93 year old grandmother. I spend uh, uh, one afternoon every weekend sitting with her mm. and uh, doing honeydews for her and uh, and my mom and, and my sisters. I mean, you know, we've got a, you know, uh, we, you know, I enjoy, I enjoy, I enjoy it all. That's the thing, Bruce is like I said, I've got a life by design Isn't and uh, you know, there's, there's, there's so little in my life. When I look at my calendar, I think, Oh, I have to go do that today. Yeah. And I just, you know, it's, it's, you know, it's, this could be my last day on the planet. And I, and I remind myself of that all the time that there's no promise for tomorrow. What happened yesterday is today. All I've got is this instant right now and what I'm going to do with it. And, uh, I don't want to waste it. I've, I've shared before with listeners on the podcast. It is not a myth. This is truth. When you find the work you love, you'll never work a day in your life. And, and that's what you're doing. And I love everything you're sharing. It's very inspirational. And I know people are that are listening are taking tremendous notes right now. Hey, I have one last question for you. It's one of my favorite questions I like to ask. And, and uh, Mike, 10 years older, is knocking at your door. And you're going to go answer that door. What's he going to tell you? Well, first of all, he's going to say you were right. It's a lot less expensive not to have all these kids on your payroll. <laughs> I think that's going to be part of it. Uh, and you're seeing a theme here, right? I'm a little anxious about this. And uh, but uh, I think he'll say you married the right woman, mm -hmm. and and the the last ten years of just the two of you being together, and 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 you know, uh, without the distractions and it, the different life that we you, you have when you have kids in the house and when you don't uh i think he's going to say you know i think he would say yeah you did you, you you picked well and uh and and she's really patient and you're lucky so i love I that's what man. he's saying yeah i love it i love it well you're definitely living uh life in the leadership lane i, I uh you've earned my admiration long before this podcast but even more now so I appreciate you coming on and just sharing perspective. Hey, if someone wants to get connected with you, they, they heard something you saying about, you know, maybe it's the background checks or the values we talked about or, or something you shared. How is the best way that they could connect with you? Oh, I'm everywhere. But uh, imperativeinfo.com okay. is the company, which is the worst domain ever. But I, I created it, you know, 23 years ago. I'm stuck with it. Um, or goodmorninghr.com is the podcast. Uh, but Mike Coffee SPHR on Facebook. Um, you know, uh, I'm I'm everywhere. It's I'm not hard to find. I'll put and, the link. And I will always welcome anybody to reach mm -hmm. out, even people who aren't my clients. Uh, if you've got an HR question and or a background check question or a, what would you do in this situation question. I love those. I often will spend more time on those than the things that actually pay, get me paid because I just, I, I really enjoy it. So don't hesitate to reach out if I can ever help. I'll put those links in the show notes because I, I, I'm pretty sure someone's going to reach out to you and have a question, especially if it's a, a free resource, yeah. uh, but someone that uh, has been around a long time, somebody that's experienced and somebody that has that uh, serving heart. And so uh, appreciate you sharing that. I appreciate you being on the show. It's, it's a, Thanks like, for having me, man. I've, I've enjoyed knowing you for many years. We served together at Texas Sherm, but uh, just to uh, have you on the show and, and to be able to share this conversation, it's a real treat. So appreciate you, my friend. Thanks, Bruce. And thank you for all you do. We yeah, appreciate you, you at Texas Sherm. Thanks.